We're going to go ahead and begin. And uh, it, this is the history of the Hittite civilization uh, in Anatolia, uh, going through its history, a culture, and religious beliefs. Uh, so what we're going to do, as opposed to sometimes I give a, a, a little prologue, I just kind of want to jump into where our knowledge of the Hittites arrived from. Where does it come from? Because for so long, um, uh, throughout more modern history, people talk about the Mesopotamian civilization. They'll talk about the Egyptians. They'll talk about, obviously, ancient Israel. And um, and then, of course, the Mycenaeans. Before that, of course, the Minoans. But the Hittites kind of got uh, kind of a, a, a sh the short uh, stick, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, And so, um, and, and they are kind of Johnny-come-lately. It's not like nobody knew they existed it's like they just didn't know much about them and so we're going to go ahead and go into that gradual discovery now at first i want to say that the only known knowledge of the that we had of the ancient hittites was references uh in the bible uh in various places uh for example in uh, in the book of genesis uh they are mentioned uh as the the children of Heth, right, uh, enlisted under the umbrella with the other eleven Canaanite nations, even though uh, they're they're not Canaanite. Uh, but there it is. Uh, their location varies, but around the supposed time of Abraham, which sometimes they guesstimate around 1800 BCE, they are understood as living near Canaan, uh, the region. Uh, which, of course, is much of the Levant today. Uh, this is, of course, Levant is inclusive of, of Israel, Palestine, and, and Jordan. Um, and it's also Lebanon and Syria. Accordingly, uh, it was the Hittite Ephron who, so, who sold Abraham a cave in Hebron. Uh, later, of course, uh, Esau was said to have married wives uh, from the Hittites, uh, following uh, his loss of his birthright to Joshua. God is said to have told Joshua, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your border. Uh, this land uh, of the Hittites on Canaan's border is seen to stretch between Lebanon and the Euphrates and from there to the setting sun. So, of course, we know today that, yes, uh, the Hittites did have some of these territories, but the heartland uh, is in Anatolia. Now, I want to be very clear. Um, we always like making things more complicated than they should be, uh, we scholars. Uh, it's kind of like when we talk about uh, you have the area that's known as Israel, right? You know, and uh, it's interesting the name Palestine uh, came at the same time around 1200 BCE that, that they both called that region. And and this region is also known as Canaan long before that, going back to 1800 BCE. Uh, and they call the larger area uh, the Levant. And you're thinking, oh, how, it's just so many names. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, the, the area where we're... where, where uh, Hittites are used to be, you know, like we call it Anatolia. And then when it becomes closer to the Greek and Roman tradition, we call this exact same geographical area Asia Minor. Uh, and then when the Turks arrive, you know, especially after the Battle of Manzikirk in 1071, uh, suddenly we call that Turkey. Uh, so I'm not going to call this region Turkey. The reason is, is there's no Turks there. <laughs> during the time they hit died. So, you know, <laughs> can you call a place Turkey when there's no Turks? So this is making sense. So, uh, but still, it, this is evidence of how far the Hittites had stretched, supposedly, uh, during the time of Abraham. Uh, we're not done with the with the biblical stories. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's uh, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you one more. And then I'll run away. Um, according to the book of, of First Chronicles, Uriah, known as the Hittite, happened to be a captain uh, in supposedly in King David's army. 
uh, known as one of the, the mighty men, and who, of course, David sent to the front lines to get killed so he could marry his wife Bathsheba. So that was not very nice, right? So Bathsheba, uh, uh, her former husband was supposedly uh, this Uriah the Hittite. Not to be confused with the group Uriah Heap. Anyway, moving right along. Okay, I know one person got that reference. The first archaeological discovery uh, connected to the Hittites uh, was conducted by a certain Felix uh, Charles Texier. Uh, he lived from 1802 to 1871. He was a, a French historian uh, and architect and archaeologist to kind of combine those areas together. He's known for his excavations of Ostia and Phrygis. In 1833, Texier arrived in, I guess we'll call it Asia Minor, uh, or Turkey, right, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And by 1834, was the first to discover the ruins of Hattusa, the ancient Hittite uh, capital. Uh, his discoveries were later published. And, uh, but while Texier discovered the ruins of Hattusa, he did not make the connection that they were Hittite ruins at all. The first actual archaeological evidence for the Hittites that could be identified were tablets discovered uh, at the Assyrian colony of Canish Kultepi. Uh, so, uh, as is typical for the discovery of various sites across the Middle East in the 19th century, ancient Canish was first detected through, well, you know, <laughs> looting, right? The looting uh, that unearthed various treasures there. Uh, Klaus of Varenhof believes that the first tablets appeared around uh, 1880, via the antiquities market, while Tassin uh, Orsguk asserts that the first cuneiform tablets were found there in 1871, you know, but still within 10 years. Nevertheless, uh, the first archaeological expedition to Canis was led by Ernest Santre, uh, arrived at there around 1893. It lasted only uh, two years. In these tablets, so let's just go to the first picture. In these tablets were discovered uh, trade records between this colony and the land of the Hatti, uh, clearly indicating uh, various uh, economic exchanges between the Assyrians and the Hittites. So now we have confirmation of where they are. Um, let's go to the next image. That's good. You see the little tablets there. It all ends right there. Oh, angle. She said, look, where's the... That if there's, there's something there. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll take that one down. Uh, but actually, keep it up. Keep it up. I like this. Uh, soon, keep it up. Uh, soon, level seven of Canis Coltepe, uh, dating around the Middle Bronze Age, revealed more Hittite associations in regards to the discovery of the palace of a certain king, Anita which was identified when a bronze dagger was later found on the site in 1954, which simply read Palace of Anita the King, which you're seeing right now, right here. Okay. King Anita is mentioned in later Hittite records as a predecessor of the Hittite Old Kingdom Dynasty. So he is a predecessor of that, depending on the interpretation uh, from his old capital at Kusura, Anita uh, extended his domains uh, first to Kanish and then to Hattush. Now, it does appear that Anita transferred his government directly to the city of Kanish. The basic topography of Kanish during King Anita located all the official buildings on the western half of the mound, while the smaller houses occupied the eastern side. The stone masonry used in the construction of many of the monumental structures would be a prototype for masonry familiar uh, later on within the Hittite Empire. Uh, so I, I find uh, this is fascinating. It's, it's kind of cool uh, to just actually see uh, the inscription, is it not, right? Uh, let's take a look at the next picture. Uh, this is kind of the overview of, uh, there it is, of, of ancient uh, Canis. All right, okay. So. 
Uh, thank you. So canes or Colt Tepe. Okay, thank you so much. We'll, we'll put that one down temporarily. So um, I want to mention that um, this is just a personal aside. I'll just throw this one in. When I took, uh, when I was uh, being trained as an archaeologist at Claremont Graduate University under Tammy Snyder, um, I had to focus on two different ancient sites in two different courses in preparation for my various studies. And one was the city of Tel Dan, uh, which, of course, uh, is in Israel today. And the other was Kol Tepe, Kanish uh, Kol Tepe. So I had to go through all the site reports. And <laughs> I have a very long paper on it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I just think it's kind of fun. Okay, so moving on in 1884, uh, William Wright discovered an inscription at Hattusas saying the people of Hattusas established this city. This script actually matched the hieroglyphic scripts that were found in northern Syria, for example, at Aleppo and Hamalt. And so here we have finally a connection. The next evidence, let's go to the next uh, uh, picture. I was going to say the next slide. <laughs> it's like, what are we? You know, so that's the image there. This right here. Uh, so before we go there, the next major discovery occurred in 1887 with the discovery of El Marna in Egypt and the famous Amarna letters containing the correspondence of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and Akhenaten. Two letters were written from what was described as the kingdom of Keta, while it was written in a standard Akkadian cuneiform script and so could be sounded out. It was clearly a different and unknown language. Now, this 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 uh, handsome man here, this is the uh, uh, this is uh, um, uh, the linguist uh, by the name of Biedrich Horonsi, um, and and so he's the one who cracked the code, uh, cracked the code in ancient Hittite. What had happened, a little background here, is that the German Oriental Society began excavating this place of Hattusas again uh, in 1906 with a follow-up in 1907 and then from 1911 to 1913. Under Hugo Winkler, they discovered this, this archive containing literally thousands of hardened clay tablets estimated to be around 10,000. Can you imagine the discovery of over 10,000 tablets of information? That's a lot of materials, but they couldn't read any of it until we get to this guy. This guy, uh, he's a Czech linguist. He lived from 1979, sorry, sorry, 1879. Hopefully not 1979. We're in trouble. 1879 to 1952. Sorry, I'm laughing up a store over here. Okay. Um, and um, uh, he announced his discovery on November 24th, 1915, uh, at a lecture held at the Near Eastern Society of Berlin. Uh, and the preface of the book declares, the present work undertakes to establish the nature and structure of the hitherto mysterious language of the Hittites and to decipher this language. It will be shown that Hittite is in Maine an Indo-European language. You're thinking, okay, yeah, okay. So, uh, but I think many of you got, are you are, are like me. I want to know exactly how he cracked the code. Don't you want to know how? People say they cracked the code. So what I'm going to do is let's go to the next image. I'm going to tell you exactly how they, they. Here it is. Look at this. So to solve the mystery. About the Hittite language, I like this kind of stuff. Um, he used two sentences that appeared in a line that that reads "Nu Ninda An Azateni Water Ma Ukuteni." It was known. You can see that right there, written right there. Uh, it was known at that time that the ideogram for Ninda means bread. In Sumerian. So he thought that the suffix, the on, was perhaps the Hittite accusative. Then he assumed that the second word, the ed eza, had something to do with the bread and assumed that it would or could be the verb meaning to eat. So, in a sense, ed eza means to eat. Now, of course, there's a comparison because the Latin word. Edo and the English word eat 
and the German Essen, you could see where this could be a conclusion, right? Which is fascinating, right? So this led to the assumption that this sentence means Ninda on Isatani, you will eat bread. <laughs> Well, in the second sentence, he was struck by the word watar. What does that sound like? Watar. That sounds a lot like, hmm, think about it. it. Sounds like the English water. It sounds like the German Wasser. Remember, these are Indo-European languages. It has the same roots as our language, right? And so what he did is the last word of the second sentence, um, ikutini, had the stem ecu, which seems to resemble the Latin aqua, right? Ecu aqua. So we translate the second sentence, you will drink water. Ah, so you will eat bread. You will drink water. Using these insights, da da da, he cracked the code. <laughs> right? He can go from there. Uh, so uh, it is curious that Hittite actually lacks some of the characteristics of many other <laughs> Indo-European languages, such as a distinctive a distinction between masculine and feminine grammatical gender, uh, a subjunctive and optative moods and aspects. But uh, there you have it. I thought, so yeah, so the code is now officially cracked. Well, where do we go from here? Okay, so, so the Hittites go to the next um, image. The Hittites originated from the Indo-European homeland located about the Pontic steppe region north of the Black Sea in what is now, yes, Ukraine, and related to the Kurgan culture. Sometime between 3000 to 2000 BCE, the Hittites, a branch of the Indo-Europeans, arrived in Anatolia, but when they arrived, they encountered many other groups of people living in the area, most notably the Haitians and the Hurrians. Now, these are Haitian designs. Look at that, look at that kind of the spiral that you see there. The Haitians were a non-Indo-European people living in central Anatolia with roots that go back to the Stone Age. The Haitians lacked a strong central government. Uh, were divided up into uh, city-states based upon uh, a theocracy. Uh, the Haitians uh, worshipped, go to the next image, a very uh, prominent, except in this picture, prominent mother goddess uh, connected with the earth and fertility of, of the fields, right? Um, uh, so let's we'll take that image. Uh, let's go. We'll take it down for a few moments because I'm going to go to the next section. Um they were also devoted to the storm god by the name of Taru, represented by a bull. The sun goddess, uh, Furusumu, represented by a leopard. And a number of other elemental gods. The reliefs at Chatohuyak show a female figure giving birth to a bull. Uh, perhaps the mother goddess, uh, Katahaba, or Hanahana, which will go into the Hittite worship was then mother to the storm god, Taru. And you're going to see this connection uh, later on. The concept of the earthbound deity was deeply rooted in the indigenous Haitian consciousness all the way back from prehistoric times. Uh, somebody uh, who I greatly respect, uh, his name is James Millart, uh, has proposed that the indigenous Anatolian religion revolved around a water from the earth concept. A water from the earth concept. Pictorial and written sources, he says, show that the deity of paramount importance to the inhabitants of Anatolia was the terrestrial water god. Many gods are connected with the earth and water. In Hittite cuneiform, the terrestrial water god is generally represented um, uh, the storm gods, of course, it goes on. So it's very interesting. Okay. So moving right along, Mesopotamian tablets from the era of Sargon, the great, uh, this, these are really rough dates because there's, depends on what calendar system you're a part of. I'm going to throw in uh, 2334 to 2279 BCE, but these, there's lots of fights about this. 
Anyway, um, Sargon the Great refers to the land, just think of this as the, the 23 and 2200s, refers to the land of the Hatti. Uh, these particular tablets arrive from Assyria uh, and, of course, um, uh, and as, as well as Akkadian uh, traders asking for help. We know that Sargon had to fight a Luvian king uh, by the name of Nur Dago in the region. So the Luvians are part of all this. Uh, Nuram Sin of Akkad, uh, again, rough dates 2254 to 2218, to the grandson of Sargon, uh, succeeded, uh, was recorded as fighting Pamba, uh, king of the Hatai, who eventually formed an alliance of 17 kings against him, uh, including Zapani, king of Kadesh. Hmm. Eventually, the Hatians would succumb to the Hittites, who would adopt the name of the region of Hatai as their own. So what will happen is these Indo-European Hittites <laughs> uh, uh, will go to the realm of the Hatti and then adopt that name as their own region. So you're going, wow, they sound alike. Well, now you know. <laughs> Hitti, Hatti. Okay. As for the Hurrians, I do have just a, just a, one image that's maybe slightly interesting. Well, I have two images of the Hurrians. Let's go ahead and, and put an uh, so, uh, image of the Hurrians there. We got a picture from the ruins there. Yeah, there, there. next one. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. As for the Hurrians, uh, another group uh, that were there when the Hittites arrived, they lived further to the east in what is now much of southeastern Turkey and Syria, northern Lebanon, and northern Iraq. They spoke a non-Semitic huro uratian language and worshipped many gods and goddesses that would be adopted by the Hittites as well. Uh, we'll go to the next image, why not? In general, the most important Hurrian deities were as follows. You had Tishub, the weather god, Hibat, or Hepa, his wife, uh, and the mother goddess, also re re regarded as the sun goddess, amongst the Hittites, uh, drawn from the deified Sumerian queen Kubaba, which is sometimes understood as Hibali, right? You have Saruma, uh, and of course you have the uh, the son of Tishab. Um, you have uh, Kumardi, the ancient father of Tishab. His home is described in mythology as the city of Urkish. You have Shashika, uh, the Hurrian counterpart of the Assyrian Ishtar, and a goddess of fertility, war, and healing. You have Shemegi, the sun god, and you have also Kashu, uh, the moon god, with the symbols of the sun and the crescent moon often joining together in Hurrian iconography. See the sun and the moon often together. Oh, you also have Nergal, if you're interested in the Babylonian deity of the underworld. You even have Ea, who is also Babylonian origin, and was sometimes blended with a Canaanite high god by the name of El. So Ea and El are sometimes connected together, which I think is fascinating. Oh, you have Yom, also the god of the sea and the river. So according to the Hurrian religion from the same, um, uh, the, the sky god Anu uh, had his uh, genitals bit off by his son, Kumbarbus, who spat out three deities, one of whom, Tishab, uh, later uh, deposed. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, uh, so signs of, of, of things uh, to come. Uh, there you have it. So, okay, so um, uh, by the Middle Bronze Age, the Hurrians were divided into many kingdoms. Uh, then, of course, um, which we will go into in detail. Go to the next image. I'm going to show this one here. I want to show kind of what Anatolia looks like. There it is. Uh, so you, basically what happens is that is that you have another group that is to the west. So you see there's that will be the Hittite realms to the east, and you see that little line that kind of crosses right in the middle of Anatolia. On the left-hand side of that, that's the realm of the Luvians, so, uh, which is much of western Anatolia. You can see that right there. Um, so beyond the Hittians and the Hurrians, the Luvians... Uh, now, it turns out that uh, the Hittites and Alluvians are related uh, to one another. Uh, they are kindreds, although they don't always get along. Oh, why wow, the uh, Hittites took the plateau 
uh, region of the central Anatolia. Uh, it was the Luvians that took the entire coastal regions, as you can see, uh, going there. Uh, so, but they're all Indo-Europeans. They speak a, re a related language. Now, they arrived along with the Hittites in northwestern Anatolia. Some say as early as 3000 BCE in the areas known as the Troad and Phrygia. Uh, let's go to the next uh, image. Uh, so there you have, so so all those little things that you see there, on the, all those little circles, those are all Luvians. So there's quite a few of them, and they're known by various names uh, you see there. So I uh, kind of designated them. Okay, um, and so go to the next image. There we go. Okay, so, so what will happen here is that um, uh, many of these Luvians, we know that the Luvians were already distinct by the time they were uh, uh, at Troy, as, as in Troy number two. Take a look at that chart. chart. You see Troy number two, and you see 2500 to 2300 BCE. That's the, we have evidence of the Luvians already being here who are related to the Hittites. Uh, and uh, they were part of that population. Uh, they made a particular kind of pottery type known as red slip pottery. And we can trace that pottery as they settled further south, west, and east, reaching northern Syria during the second millennium. Uh, so we know that they were, uh, well, quite uh, important uh, and a significant part of the population of Anatolia. Uh, many scholars also agree that maybe they all entered into Anatolia at exactly the same time uh, with the Luvians moving towards uh, the western shores and the Hittites at the same time moving to the central plateau uh, region. And I think that is highly likely. Okay. Now, according to the Hittite code, uh, written old Hittite, uh, the majority of the areas where Luvian-speaking peoples lived was called Luia, um, which is, of course, related to the Mycenaean word Ruanio in Linear B. Throughout the second into the first millennia, Luvian became the dominant language of Troy, known as Welusa, the Siha Riverland, um, which is around the Hermos River, and, of course, in Myra, as well as the Meander region. In fact, the corrupt late copy of Hittite code, the area is known as Arzawa, uh, which corresponds to the Mycenaean name for the region. And so there you have it. Uh, by the 14th century BCE, Luvian speakers came to constitute the majority of the Hittite uh, capital of Hattusa. So they were, and we have identified about 340 large cities uh, that dotted the region that are all Luvian. So uh, pretty, pretty significant there. Okay, so now let's uh, let's go ahead and take that down. I'm going to go ahead, though. Let's talk about the Hittites now. We kind of know our general surroundings. Now, as long as the old Assyrian Empire, which is 225 uh, to 1750 BCE, was in power with their colonies in eastern Anatolia and having many vassal states around them, the arriving Hittites were weaker, and they were organized into city-states that lacked the central power of any kind. It is from the Semitic Assyrians that the Hittites adopted their cuneiform script, now modified to fit an Indo-European language. We know from various depictions and art that the Hittites uh, had heavy features, uh, great curved noses, sloping foreheads, huge beards, and were clothed in close-fitting uh, close uh, outfits, sleeveless jerkins. And one interesting distinction is the, the men wore kilts. That's right. So there you have it. <laughs> Make the Irish and the Scottish proud, right? The earliest history of the Hittites was recorded around the 17th century BCE, but have only survived in Akkadian copies transcribed around the 14th and 13th centuries. So we do uh, have some, some records 
no here right so um and so here it is so what happens is is that there happen to be two flavors of hittites right uh you had the northern hittites uh, that were based in zalpa and hattusa let's go to the pictures uh, real quick here there we go okay okay so what happens is that you have two okay two groups okay so you have the northern hittites that were based at zalpa and hattusas and um and these names uh northern hittite names are often Haitian in origin what we know about the northern hittites is that the city of zalpa was located next to the sea of zalpa which is most likely the black sea now there is a story uh, uh, <laughs> discovered in the proclamation of Anita that refers to Zalpa. This is kind of a strange story. It says as follows. It says, the queen of Canish once bore 30 sons in a single year. Um, I don't think that the story uh, should be understood as literal. She said, what a horde is this which I have borne? You think she culped baskets with dung, put her sons in them, and launched them in the river. The river carried them down to the sea at the land of Zelpawa. Then the gods took them up out of the sea and reared them. <laughs> when some years had passed, the queen again gave birth, this time to oh, 30 daughters. This time she herself reared them. <laughs> so okay, so so that is those are the uh, the northern uh, uh, <laughs> Hittites. What a, that's a story you'll not forget. In fact, I got to tell you this ahead of time. Some of these, the kinds of stories that you're gonna hear about the Hittites, it, it's it's a whole completely different culture in so many different ways. Uh, but uh, you'll see. Now the southern Hittites were based at Kusura and Kanish also known as Nisa, and you can see that on there, right? Once in the Syrian colony, the names of the Southern Hittites are often Indo-European, mostly Hittite and Luvian names. It appears that both the Northern and Southern Hittites wanted the city of Kadesh, again on this map known as Nisa. The Northern Hittites, as led by King Una of Zalpa, attacked Kadesh first in 1833 BCE. According to the Anita text, King Pithana Akusara of the Southern Hittites then conquered Canish for themselves around 1780 BCE, making the city their new center of power, although uh, Kusura re retained its importance. So you kind of see uh, there. Uh, let's go to the next image. And so this right here is known as the Anita text. You're looking at it. It's in cuneiform. So the first, I guess the first, yeah, king that we know of, of the Hittites, his name is Anita. Supposedly, he reigned from 1745 to 1720 BCE um, uh, from the southern Hittites. Uh, once he was well established at Kanish, he left what was known as the Anita text, which preserves the earliest Hittite writing. And you're seeing it right here. Here, Anita records how he decided to expand his kingdom northward, conquering many cities of the northern Hittites, including Hattusas, which he then cursed. Finally, he was able to take Zalpa under King Hosea. According to the Anita text, it appears that Hosea was a vassal at one time to Anita, but then he rebelled against him. Anita then retrieved the god of Canish from Zalpa and gave it back to the city of Kanish. Anita refers to a great alliance against him, stating that he conquered, quote, all the lands from Zalpua by the sea. Uh, so there, so it is suspected that obviously this is kind of propaganda uh, for the southern branch of the royal family uh, against the uh, the uh, the other branch uh, of this of the north. But uh, uh, there you have it. Uh, let's. Uh, let's go to the next image. I just want you to see kind of what the artwork looks like. Ooh, that's, look at all those eye-like designs. Uh, King Anita was succeeded by uh, by Zuzu. 
So uh, Zuzu and um, uh, but uh, and so and sometime uh, and of course at that time or between seven ten to seven oh five Kanish was destroyed, taking the long established Assyrian merchant colony with it. Um, and so meanwhile the Lords of Zappa lived on, and so eventually uh, you're gonna have. Let's go to the next image. Uh, so you, you see, this is of course uh, uh, the, the old site, of course of Kanish. Uh, go to the next picture. Good, that's good. Okay, so this is a bowl that has the name of Labarna the first on it, and he's considered the founder of the old Hittite kingdom, uh, which spanned between 1600 to 1450 BCE. Uh, now, according to uh, the uh, Telepanu Proclamation, which is from 1550 BCE. Many of the sons uh, fought against uh, Labernana for the throne, but he defeated them and their allied forces, and he made them borders of the sea, which may indicate that he pushed them to the very edges of Anatolia and all the way along the Mediterranean and the Black Seas. So next, uh, what will happen? Uh, let's go to the next image. So this is the region. Uh, that he managed to hold, right? Next, Labarna made his sons governors of the important cities of the region. Uh, and then after that, uh, the old Hittite kingdom was further strengthened under Hutuslus I, uh, 1586 to 1556, who immediately followed uh, Labarna, although some contend that maybe he's also known as Labarna II. Hattusus claimed to have extended the Hittite domains to the sea and the second year to have subdued uh, cities into Syria. He, could, he also com campaigned against Azua Arzawa, right? All right, so there you have it. Of course, Azua was a league of 22 cities, but we won't talk about that at, the, at that point. So here we go. So Hattusus then moved the city, uh, the capital, of the of the of the empire from Kanish to Hutusas. Let's look at the next image. There we go. There are around thirty temples located at at uh, Hattusas itself. This is the capital. Uh, they all have um, many of them have central courtyards surrounded by colonnades and columns. Uh, there was a royal palace with pillars of wood. Uh, and a very immense parade hall. The city wall was built of stone blocks on an earth embankment about 20 feet high. Let's take a look at the walls real quick. These are reconstructions of the walls. The gates are decorated with giant sculptures. The most impressive are found in the representations of the god of war at the royal gates. Modern estimates put the population of the city between 40 to 50,000 uh, in total uh, at its peak. Now, let's go to the next. This is now. We're ready for the fun. So what about the laws of the Hittites? I told you they found all those documents. <laughs> uh, here's one of them right here. So the Hittites, they're interesting. Um, they, um, they, they, they took their laws from the old Babylonians. I guess you you can see me right now, but this you can see uh, what the laws look like. Let's let's go here. So um, take the image down. Thank you. the The most extensive literature that the Hittites have left us, in fact, are decrees and laws. Uh, these laws were far more merciful than the laws of the old Babylonians, uh, perhaps because the Hittites were less concerned about maintaining a rigid, uh, despotic central authority, <laughs> while you could lose your life just for about almost everything <laughs> in the old Babylonian system of laws. Uh, in fact, uh, in, old, in old Babylonia, if you were too rowdy in a tavern, uh, <laughs> you could be put to death. <laughs> too loud and obnoxious, here they come. Uh, they're going to, they're going to, to take you out. But uh, what happens when it comes to the Hittites is that even premeditated murder 
only resulted in a fine, a large fine to be sure, but it's then preferable than losing your head. Uh, they modified the role of the monarch in that they gave the king ownership of all the land under his control. Uh, previously under the Sumerians, the Amorites, private property was allowed and the monarch only owned his own private property. Individuals were allowed to control over their lands, but it still all belonged to the king. And so what happened is only by serving in the king's army and as a result, <laughs> uh, the bulk of the population then became like tenant farmers, right? Now, there, there are eight main groups of laws. Um, first of all, you have aggression and assault. Number two, marital relationships. Number three, obligation and service. Number four, assaults on property and theft. Number five, contracts of prices. Number six, sacral matters. And, and number six, uh, so number seven, sorry, uh, contracts and tariffs. And number eight, sexual relationships, which, are called, which is called percal. So I'm going to give you a little taste test of some of these um, some of these laws. I want you to hear for yourself. Accordingly, if anyone kills, I'm reading from the text, if anyone kills a man or a woman in a quarrel, he shall bring him for burial and shall give four persons, male or female respectively, he shall look to his house for it. What? what? So if anyone kills somebody in a quarrel, uh, uh, you have to take care of the burial and you have to exchange that person's life that you that you took with uh, four people. So I guess one life that's taken equals four people, and it could be male or female, respectively. Uh, and you're also supposed to look after their house. So take care of what's going on because sometimes they, you know, they, oh, they have a wife or kids. You have to take care of it. This may be an incentive to not kill somebody in a fight because you're going to be stuck paying the bills of that person's family. Let's keep going. Another one. If anyone injures a person and temporarily incapacitate, incapacitates him, he shall provide medical care for him. In his place, he shall provide a person to work on his estate until he recovers. So if, if you injure a person, and uh, you, you're going to have to prepare, uh, you have to give them medical treatment. And then you have to put somebody there to work for them. When he recovers, I'm still reading, his assailant uh, assailant shall pay him six shekels of silver and shall pay the physician's fee as well. So what this is basically saying is that if you injure somebody, right, uh, you have to pay uh, for the medical care uh, and you got to. And and if he, since he can't work, you have to replace the labor as well and plus uh, pay him six shekels of silver. Uh, so, yeah, so don't do that. Now this is this next one is a, is an interesting one, and I'm saying that I'm not about this. This tells you what a different culture this is, and you'll probably not forget this. This is probably the one thing you'll remember from this talk. You go, oh man, if anyone, this is actually written, if anyone bites off the nose of a free person, uh, we'll stop there. If anyone bites off the nose of a free person, why would you bite off the nose of anybody? He shall pay 40 shekels of silver. He shall look to his house for it. Uh, by the way, they later raised it uh, from 40 shekels uh, to uh, 1,200 shekels. It went from 40 shekels to 1,200 shekels. So apparently they really don't want you uh, biting off more than you can chew. <laughs> I mean, you really have to pay through the nose. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh nose. Uh, now, for male or female slaves, uh, if you bite off the nose, it is only three shekels. But it was later raised to 600 shekels which is half the amount of the other. So, so don't do that. 
no and i'm trying to trying to imagine what kind of conflict it would be when you just are talking to someone and you're going you know what i'm going to do i think i'm going to bite off that person's nose right right <laughs> all right now if anyone causes a free i'm reading right from the i'm reading right from these these tablets if anyone causes a free woman to miscarry if it is her 10th month uh 12 shekels uh sorry yeah uh, he shall pay um it, and he will pay 10 shekels of silver uh if it is her fifth month it kind of it kind of he shall pay five shekels of silver uh, he shall also look to his house for it. Uh, by the way, this this inscription, as you can know, I'm looking at it, has lots of dots in between, so it's kind of garbled. <laughs> but you get the idea. You got to pay for it. And it looks also, I want to mention the fact that they make changes on these tablets. They're they're scratching things out, going, no, we're going to raise that price. Uh, people are human after all, right? Up the prices. Um, if a looming abducts a free person, male or female, from the land of Hati, and leads him away to the land of Lubia, and subsequently the abducted uh, person's owner recognizes him, the abductor shall uh, bring his entire house or forfeit his entire house. So, wow. If a Hittite abducts a Lubian man in the land of Hatti itself and leads him away to the land of Luya, formerly they gave 12 persons, but now he shall give six persons. He shall look to his house for it. Okay, interesting stuff. What, but there's a, there's a few. There's a few, there are very few penalties for death, but there's a few. And I'll, I'll give you two of them right now. One is bestiality. Uh, was considered a criminal action, except with your horse or mule. That was okay. Other than that, uh, that was a death sentence. So none of that. Um, you know, another one that's kind of strange. Uh, has to do with cuisine. If a, if a Hittite who is a chef or he's a cook, if he has a really long unkept beard or his hair is really long uh, and and ruly, um, he could get the death penalty. <laughs> so apparently uh, they're very much in the hygiene. They don't want any hairs <laughs> in their food. <laughs> You can't make this up. Also, if you have live animals in the kitchen, that could be the death penalty. So it's strange. You know, you, you can murder somebody and pay compensation, but lo and behold, don't get a hair on my food. <laughs> you can't do that. And, <laughs> okay, I got to, you got the idea. Hittite women uh, uh, had more rights uh, for they could initiate a divorce. Yeah. You have the right to initiate a divorce, <laughs> and they can keep their inheritance, and they also take half of their husband's estate if divorced. So, uh, which is interesting. So it seems a little bit, even though the Hittites are patriarchal, you still have this earlier level of rights that seem to come from more of the indigenous uh, peoples of that place. On the other hand, the expressions when it comes to, to marriage and Hittite for marriage, I should say, uh, it says they don't have the word to marry. Uh, it has to take a wife or to own a wife or to make her your wife, but they don't have the same when it comes to make her, make uh, him your, your husband. So there is that bias there when it comes to the language. Uh, early on uh, in a, a lady's life, uh, she had to make uh, she was promised to a particular uh, man or boy, I should say, uh, from this uh, stage of promise. She was bound uh, to what's called the second stage of marriage, uh, and that had to do with financial transactions. Her groom, a uh, groom's family paid a substantial uh, sum, uh, more or less depending on the family's wealth, in the form of what's called a husata, which is a bride price. Then to seal the marriage contract, a woman brought to the deal what is called an iwaru, which literally means a gift. It could be probably a dowry of some kind. Uh, so there you have it. Women uh, usually went on to live with their husbands, uh, husband's family and their household. But sometimes 
um, it went vice versa too. So there's there's exceptions uh, to all the rules. Oh, here's another one. Uh, oh, I don't want to read that one. <laughs> there, there's there's some there's some pretty interesting uh, stories here. There's another thing that 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 they're um, um, in, in the laws. If a man seizes a woman in the mountains and rapes her, the man is guilty and shall die. So, uh, so you have these kinds of laws on the books. What do they eat? Well, the Luvians, um, they like their beer and they drink a lot of it. Uh, they love wine, though, and they drink a lot of that, too. It sounds like uh, uh, they're very much uh, into uh, eating meat. Uh, and the form usually was in what we understand as a shish kebab, uh, so meat on skewers. That was, that was big with them. A lot of lugim, lugims, you know, lentils. By the way, they, they love lentil soup. In fact, hey, let's take a look at some pictures of, of uh, Hittite food. Let's go there. Let's look at some Hittite yummies. So, so first of all, here's some image of the next one is image of some daily life. Isn't that cool? Oh, by the way, this one is a uh, uh, a lady and she's breastfeeding there her, her child. Okay, let's go to the next one. There we go. Uh, these are recreation of Hittite foods. Mmm, yummy. And let's go to the next one. Take a look at these. Mmm, yummy. And then these are the skewed right here, the kebabs. Let's go to the next one here. I am hoping this is, yeah, there we go. The, the Hittites absolutely, completely love anything that has lentils in it. They, uh, some, say, some say that lentil soup was invented uh, by uh, by the Hittites, others say that it's 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 it was invented by others far beforehand. Obviously, I believe it's long beforehand. But the point of the matter is, lentils were very popular as a cuisine, as well as chickpeas. Uh, their fruits were pomegranates and figs. They loved a lot of honey on things. Uh, so you know, um, we have discovered inscriptions. That's, that give a, a typical Hittite meal from a place called Alkahuyuk, which dates about 4,000 years ago. And so let's take a look at this menu. So they have what's called, you know, now, now all learn a new word in Hittite. That's Ninda. Ninda means bread. And so they list Ninda Imza, which means uh, bread without flavor. They have Ninda uh, Gura. Uh, ninda, of course, means bread. Gur means cheese. Ra means fig. So this this is is uh, a bread that has mixed in it both cheese and figs. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You have ninda uh, popura, which means small bread. You have ninda ku, which is a sweet bread. Uh, when it comes to foods, uh, I, I mentioned like honey. They love also what's, what's understood as apricot butter. Uh, they also have mashed foods. We saw examples of that. The word for mashed foods is burua. Uh, they especially like mixing cut cucumbers in these mashed foods or the burua that has chickpeas in it. Another dish is called hapena. This is a casserole of meat, olive oil mixed with honey. They also have kariya, which is grilled lamb, liver, and hearts. But but they also enjoyed sandwiches, which is they did have <laughs> uh, bread, and they put in it uh, cooked meat mixed with onions, kind of like a falafel kind of idea, right? Uh, as far as music, harp, and lyre, sports, boxing, archery, uh, chariot racing, very much, very much like like uh, well, I mean, you know. Same like people like us in that sense. Uh, clothing, I mentioned mostly linen and wool, although they wore leather for their belts and sashes. Uh, uh, they had short kilts. Uh, women wore what's called a kuresar, which is a scarf on the head. So just a little taste of Hittite culture. There you have it. All right. So so there we go. So so thank you. I'm, I'm coming down, you know, kind of kind of hungry. So uh, you don't have it. Okay. So Let's go to the next. Uh, uh, let's pick the image down. I'll just kind of go through this. Oh, that's yeah. That's 
So we'll be talking about uh, this this law uh, in a few moments, but we'll go ahead and take it down. I'm going to go ahead and just be conversational for a little bit here. Uh, when Mersulus, uh the first uh, 1556 to 1526 came back, came to the throne, uh, he was very young and he had to be advised at first. But uh, he then expanded his empire to northern Syria. He captured Aleppo, the capital of the kingdom of Yamhad. For some reason, Mosulis decided to keep on going eastward into Mesopotamia, where in 1531 he captured Babylon. Uh, uh, some say his, his intention was to, to overthrow the Amorites. Uh, so who knows? But uh, he overextended himself. And also there was problems at home. And as a result of that, I don't want to go through all this, uh, but uh, uh, you have this gradual decline of the Hittite empire uh, at this time. The old kingdom uh, begins to fall. Uh, so, um, and there's lots of, of, how do I put this, various intrigues as there's a gradual decline of the old kingdom. Yeah, it's like a slide, right? <laughs> uh, and there's so many intrigues that I really don't want to go through everyone. Let's just put it that uh, things are falling apart. The old kingdom, uh, there's going to be um, a, a very a large gap in history. There's a group known as the uh, Caskians that will attack from the Black Sea shoreline, and they move southwards. Uh, and so, and they actually take the capital of Hattusas. As a result, the Hittites have to retreat to another uh, place uh, known as Supanawa, and then on to Samahu. So there is a retreat. And then we have a period of, of a kind of a dark age of history, a period of time when there is nothing going on. It's a time of confusion. It's a time of mystery. Uh, this, of course, is known as the Middle Hittite Kingdom period of time. From 1450 to 1380 BCE, uh, we do have some details, but Hittologists, yes, that's what they call them, Hittologists. That's like, oh, I know it's like, I'm a Hittologist. You feel like you maybe want to duck. It's like, no, 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 they don't hit. They're about the Hittites. Right? What will happen, of course, is that you have the advent of the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom from 1380 to 1180 BCE, at this period of time, the Hittites themselves moved more into southern Anatolia. The Hittite king became more powerful, uh, taking on a semi-divine status. Uh, he's even sometimes addressed as my son, as an S-U-N, revealing a more centralized veneration. The capital again became Hattusas uh, during the period of time of the new kingdom. Um, and uh, one of them, of course, is that um, you have one of the first of these new kingdom kings is known as Tudohia, uh, T-U-D-H-A-L-I-Y-A. And Tudohia, he turned his attention westward, deciding to conquer Arzawa and moving then along the Meander River Valley to the point of reaching the Aegean. Uh, there he met those known as the Ahiwa. Uh, who are now known as the Mycenaeans. Now we can look at the next picture. So I got an image of these Mycenaeans here. In the end, uh, Tunahia was able to conquer Asua, which is where we get the word uh, Asia from. Oh, okay, let's go to the go to the one before this picture. Um, I don't know. We've oh, that's Amenhotep. There it is. Uh, there you are. Those these are the Mycenaeans. Uh, so we are there, and so. What happened is, is that the, the Asua League, who he attacked, had 22 members, including the Luka, the Warusa, the Tarusa, the Walisa. Uh, and um, this league, are these are Luvians, as we, as we talked about before. Uh, Walusa is connected to ancient Troy. Eventually, uh, King uh, Tulahia uh, defeats the Asua League uh, as a uh, uh, Tudlahia was leaving the coastal regions following a military campaign against the states of Arzawa. Uh, you had other challenges going on, but eventually there's a Hittite victory 
uh, which was total, and he brought back 10,000 captive Asuan soldiers to his capital of Atusas, along with 600 teams of horses, oxen, and sheep. Uh, so there you have that. But uh, but there's this interesting relationship here with the Mycenaeans. So we discover that um, what happens is that uh, uh, to the Hia, it, there's actually a bull uh, of Hittite fashion depicting what we know to be Mycenaean warriors wearing a plumed and horned helmets. The Hittites knew the Mycenaeans very well. Most scholars now confirm that those called the Ahiwa, uh, Hittite records were indeed the Mycenaeans. You get the word Ahian from that. Uh, as many as 25 Hittite texts refer to the Mycenaeans starting uh, during the reign of Tulahia II. Um, there, in fact, there's even a damaged letter dating to, uh, from this time. Mentions the fact that the king of the Ahiwa, or the Mycenaeans, were in possession of various islands, most likely the Aegean islands directly off the coast. Tudahia was indicating through his various writings that the Mycenaeans were militarily supportive of the Asua, the Luvian Asuas, allying their forces with theirs. Uh, and so you have these various agreements going on. Uh, so uh, let's go to uh, what will happen, though, is that uh, uh, there will be a Tulahia decided that um, uh, he's going to make a certain Kukuli, the son of the former king, uh, a vassal of Asua. And so what happens is the state of Arzawa then expands north and took the places of Asua. So what basically happens uh, is that there's a defeat of the Asua League, and in that vacuum comes a new power known as Arzawa. I know these are lots of names, but uh, let's go to the next image. And so what will happen is Arzawa is looked at as really powerful, and they make an alliance with Amenhotep III. Uh, it looks like they're the next big power that's to come about. Uh, and they form what's called the Anti-Hittite League. So there's many challenges going on. Okay, so, but following Amenhotep III, you have, you have of course, Akhenaten. Uh, and what will happen is, is that the, the Hittites take advantage of the fact that, uh, that the Egyptians are weak. Uh, and uh, they were supporting the, the side of the uh, Arzawa. And so what they will do is will cause various rebellions and, and problems. And eventually uh, they're going to take Arzawa. Okay, so let's let's kind of move through these images here because I want to, yeah, I want to get to the religion. So let's kind of kind of skip through uh, these images. because I'm looking at my time and I really want to spend some quality time talking about the religion. Okay, so keep on going. What's going to happen uh, is that the the Hittites, in summation, in summation, uh, they're going to be overthrown by those that are are known as the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples are, of course, uh, many of them are the Lubians. Um, and um, I kind of want to go here real quick. I'll just say a few things, just off the cuff, because uh, I want to again want to get to the religion part. Uh, but a long story really short is that you have uh, the Hittites expand into much of the Middle East. And the central area where they seem to get stuck uh, is what's called the Jezreel Valley. This is also known as the Valley of Armageddon. And the Egyptians seem to have the Valley of Armageddon to the south all the way, of course, to Egypt. And the Hittites have the Valley of Armageddon all the way north from there. And so these battles keep going on and they're not budging. Nothing is moving. Oh, this is good. Thank you. This is perfect timing. Thank you. This is perfect, Margie. And so under Ramses II, the Hittites are fighting this Egyptian uh, Egyptian king. Uh, and it just, it's just going back and forth. And it's, it's not moving. Nothing is happening. So they decide to make an agreement. They decide to, uh, well, one, one more thing I want to bring up. I, I'm just in the mood to talk a little bit more. One more thing is, is that they decided that um, the Egyptians are, because this war between the Hittites and the Egyptians are going on forever. It's constantly uh, on hand. And too many Egyptian sons are dying in these wars in the Levant. 
The Hittites are thinking the same thing. So what are we going to do? Oh, I got an idea. Uh, maybe take the take the, uh, the picture down, but that's Ramses uh, the second. That's a great picture. We'll go back to that. I got an idea. Why do we have to fight constantly? Why don't we put our men on chariots? So the Egyptians put their men on chariots. The Hittites put their men on chariots, chariot warfare. And we'll have the foot soldiers as mercenaries. Well, who's going to do that? Well, the Egyptians decide that we're going to hire those known as the Sheridan, who are Luvian peoples, and they'll fight as uh, as the as the as, uh, you know the infantry. They'll fight as these foot soldiers. The Hittites decide that uh, that they're going to use the Luka as their foot soldiers. So the idea is that when they go into battle, you got these foot soldiers. Uh, who are the Sheridan for the Egyptians and the Luka uh, for the Hittites, and they'll fight each other. With behind them, you have the chariots of the Egyptians on one side and the uh, the Hittites on the other. And it seems like that in the fight that that the the mercenaries on the Hittite side are losing, the Hittites can quickly flee uh, with their sons on chariots and get away to life. <laughs> And it happens to happen the, the other way, then it's the same idea, right? You know, then the Egyptians flee and the merchants, merchants are the ones who, the mercenaries, the mercenaries are the ones who lose everything. They're the ones who die. Now, lo, what happens now is, is that, is that they're, they're stuck in the area of the Jezreel Valley in Canaan, cut and just stuck there. So what happens? is they decide to agree on what is known as the Peace of Kadesh. Uh, in this Peace of Kadesh, uh, this is the first major uh, peace treaty uh, in the ancient in the ancient world that we that we know of. Uh, it there becomes an agreement uh, with with Ramses uh, that uh, and and the and the Hittite uh, the Hittite king. Uh, who's, of course, Ahutosilia, uh, uh, they make an agreement uh, in 1258. And this agreement uh, at Kadesh uh, agreed that they would have peace. This seems to be a good thing, right? This seems to be a good thing. The problem is, is that now these, uh, the, the Sheridan on one side and the Luca on the other other side are now unemployed, unemployed mercenaries that have been fighting for so many generations. What you know is going to happen is they're going to be part of the process of turning on their former employers <laughs> because all they know is looting, killing, stealing. That's the life that they're used to. Another thing that happens is that, uh, and it's unfortunate, is that the, the, the Hittites decide uh, that uh, they want to have or own the copper trade on Cyprus. Now, before this time, the Luca and the Sheridan and other Luvian groups controlled that copper trade. They were in charge. But no, uh, the Hittites wanted to have that. And so what they did is they swathed right across the coastal region of southern Anatolia and they cut right across to Cyprus, and they secured it for themselves. This is going to also cause a problem because, well, uh, this is a center for Luvian wealth. So there's going to be a lot of anger. There's going to be a lot of animosity. And you can imagine, I did a whole talk on this. That's why I don't want to repeat it. You have the rise of those known as the Sea Peoples. And the Luvians are part of that whole process, right? Uh, and that's basically what happens, right? And so uh, the whole Mediterranean world is rocked, uh, especially the Eastern Mediterranean. And in fact, they see people combine with, like, with like Libyans and other groups from North Africa, 
uh, in, in 1208. Uh, so this is just an enormous uh, disaster for everybody. So, and of course, uh, this was under uh, this seizure of Cyprus was under King Tutalahia IV. He reigned from 1237 to 1209. Well, what happens from there is Sepulunia II, who reigned from 1207 to 1178, he came to the throne, and the entire Hittite uh, empire is starting to fall. You got the Casca attacking from the north, uh, you got the Luvians attacking uh, from the south, uh, cut off on all sides. Of course, uh, he's going to be claiming victory, but all this time, uh, it is a losing battle. And that's how the Hittite Empire falls. But I want to go into the end. Uh, we'll get to the end. I want to go into the religion. So I'm kind of scooting on. So, so let's just take a look right here of Ramses. The image here. Uh, we'll just go quickly through here. And I'm going to go into the, the deities. So there's all Ramses. Uh, you know, this is, of course, the fights going on in Kadesh. Let's go to the next image. Oh, these are good. The next image. There's the fighting at Kadesh right there. Good. Okay, now skip because we already talked about Troy. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about Hittite religion because I know one of you, many of you are here to hear that. So the Hittite deities, they were very abundant in number. Uh, there's quite a few. Uh, and um, in fact, the Hittite literature mentions uh, about, uh, well, thousands and so quite a few and they mixed up uh beliefs of the hit of the hati the hurrians right so we can't go through all the beliefs but but for hittite cosmology the old gods built heaven and earth on a place called ubularis they used their copper knife to cleave the heavens from the earth then they store the copper knife in an ancient storehouse and sealed it up. They later opened the storehouse to retrieve the copper knife. Uh, so the God's house is in the heavens. And, and so you have this tripartite division here of the sky, the earth, and the nether world. So the God's house in the heavens was known as Kuntara house. As for the underworld, uh, this realm is known as the dark earth. Uh, this had an entrance with gates. It holds bronze or iron earth vessels with lead lids, right? Uh, and the sea was simply called the waters. The sea is is uh, is there, so you have that. Let's go to the next image. The chief god uh, in both the Hittites uh, and uh, the Luvians too was a god of the thunderstorm and rain. Uh, he is called Tarhun, uh, and um, also uh, known as Ta, uh, Tar, Taras as well. And the story goes, and Tesheb as well, there's lots of names. Tarhun is often shown holding an axe, often a double-headed axe or even a mace, and in the other hand, wielding a triple thunderbolt. Uh, as for his sacred animal, it is always the bull with Tarhun often having a horn crown indicating this association. Tarhun was conceived after uh, Kum Arbi uh, uh, bit off something and swallowed it, uh, which of course seems very similar to Oranus' uh, story and so forth. One of Teshub's greatest acts was the slaying of the dragon by the name of Ilyankas. The story begins with the occasion for Presenting this story uh, said to be what is known as the Puruleli Festival, which was dedicated to the storm god of heaven. The text follows and it says, let the land grow and thrive and let the land be protected. And when it indeed grows and thrives, then they perform the festival of Puruleli. Uh, this festival is understood as the Hittite New Year uh, in order to make the lands fertile and thrive. And that new year begins at the vernal equinox. So that is the Hittite new year. 
Now, the the related Ilyanka myth has many similarities to the dying God story and is often viewed as representing the struggle between life and death, abundance and drought. The sacred marriage ritual related uh, to the Purali festival was believed to be held uh, at a place called Yazokaya, which we'll, we'll, we'll see in a few moments. But let's go to the next image. The story begins. So let's take it. This is the image of Ilyanka. There it is. The story begins with a storm god and the serpent fight in the city off of Kioskusa, but the serpent defeats the storm god. The defeated storm god then calls together all the gods and asks his daughter Inara for aid. She prepares a feast with several vats of intoxicating beverages uh, and wine and beer are mentioned. Uh, after this, Inara travels to the city of Ziggurata and asks the mortal hero, Hupasaya, to aid her. <laughs> so he does agree to help. Yes, he does. Uh, so you can put the image down. He does agree to help on the condition that uh, she has, how do I put this, relations with him. And she agrees. And the two do their commingling when she states i am about to do such and such things and you will join me he responds if i may have intercourse with you i will perform your heart's desire so that's that's welcome to hittite mythology and nara then conceals this man a hupasaya and then invites the serpent and his sons to come to feast the serpent and his sons consume all the food and all the drink, and they become very drunk. At that point, Hupasaya emerged from hiding and bounds the serpent with rope, whereupon the storm god slays the serpent. Yeah, this is the story, but <laughs> the story's not over yet. For Anara confines now... <laughs> the man who she interacted with in a house on a rock in a place known as Taruka. She commands him never to look out the house's windows, lest he see his wife and children. So he's there, and after 20 years, uh, Hupasaya looks out the window, and he sees his family and demands to be released. And Nara asks, asks, asks him why he looked out the window. And then the, the rest of the lines are, are kind of lost, so we lose that. Uh, both in Hittite and Luvian stories, doors and window, windows, uh, these are understood as sacred thresholds. These are sacred portals uh, to the other side. So you see a lot of this uh, in their beliefs. Well, um, so what is this? So what's going on? Uh, well, uh, according to Alberto Rivanelli, and Whitney Green, they say that the recounting of the dragon flight could also be plausibly interpreted as the mythic reflection of earlier developments. Uh, the dragon, like other Hurrian deities, resided in his hole, right? Rather than re representing evil, he may have represented an earlier traditional religious concept of the pre Hittites who with keeping with their ecological environment, conceived of all their life-sustaining resources as residing on and under the earth. Uh, these good gods would also be responsible for, for bringing you know, supposed of evil to the land, uh, as, for example, when they periodically disappeared, which they did quite often. The disappearance of the dragon into his hole need not imply, therefore, that he and his associates were associated with evil. Later, with the increasing political dominance of the migrants from the north, south, and east, the concept of a celestial storm god of heaven as a source of all good and evil, which had been subsumed uh, into the deeply embedded Haran religious tradition, gradually became the prevalent religious ideology of the ruling elite, uh, at least in Anatolia. This resulted in the subordination of the indigenous religious concept conceptions of a terrestrial chthonic deity under the all-powerful celestial storm god of heaven, which may have been the tradition that is asserted in the Pareli festival. 
with its accompanying myth of the dragon. But there's another myth here, another myth from the same text as this one is heavily damaged, uh, beginning with an invocation to the rain. Here, the serpent manages to uh, vanquish the storm god and uh, took from him, took from the storm god, his heart and his eyes. So, so now the storm god has is blind. It's lo- storm god has lost uh, his his heart. So the storm god marries a poor man's daughter because you know what else is he going to do? And their son together marries of all people the serpent's daughter. Now it's getting interesting. The storm god continually tells his son to ask his father-in-law, can you return? Can you can you return my, my heart and eyes? Eventually, the serpent returns them, and the son takes them to his father. Made whole again, the storm god, Tarahunas, travels down to the sea where the storm god vanquishes the serpent. What? His son had joined the serpent in begging his father to kill him too. And so the storm god did. Well, that's what you get for a good deed, right? Yeah, you know, I I took your eyes and heart, but I gave it back, didn't I? Didn't I? You know, but uh, hey, you know. So the storm god is about to take some action uh, when the text breaks off. So we get a little idea of some of these stories. Uh, So uh, let's go to the next image. So Tarahunas. There we go. Okay, so this is Pelopanu. His name means exalted son and is often called the noble god. And he was the deity of agriculture, including of irrigation as well as plowing, and was perhaps even intended to embody the crops, but also having to do with the weather in relation to these crops. Uh, Telepanu uh, was the firstborn son of Tarhun. And the solar goddess Araniti, Telpanu's wife, uh, who also was known as the goddess Hatupuna. Now, according to the, um, we're going to take this down temporarily. According to, thank you, Margie, according to the Telpanu myth, Telpanu disappears, being angry for some reason, and so storms off into the, the steppe land with his sandals on the wrong feet. Don't you hate when you get your sandals on the wrong feet? Uh, Where he then becomes weary, uh, I I can see why, and falls into a deep, deep sleep. Because Telpanu is asleep and so had abandoned uh, his assigned duty. I mean, he is sleeping. Remember, he is the vegetation deity. All fertility ceases, both that related to plant life and to animal life. Uh, the myth relates as follows. It says, mist seized the windows. I want to stop there. Once again, we're back to windows. Did you guys notice that, right? Mist seized the windows. Smoke seized the house. On the hearth, the logs were stifled. On the altars, the gods were stifled. In the fold, the sheep were stifled. In the corral, the cows were stifled. There's lots of stifling going on here, right? The sheep refused her lamb. The cow refused her calf and refusals too. Telpanu went off and took away the grain, the fertility of the herds, growth, plenty, and satiety into the wilderness, to the meadow and to the moor. Humans and gods perish from hunger. Uh, So this is what happens when you're sleeping. In order to stop the havoc and devastation, the gods seek Telepanu. Um, and so they they are all assembled, and this is uh, uh, by Tesh, uh, uh, Teshub, but they, they fail to find him. And so uh, let's go to the next image. And so this is a great name, Hana Ahara. There she is who is the great mother goddess, uh, suggests sending a bee to find him. 
while all the other gods laugh at her at the suggestion. So send the bee. Let's go to the next image. Yet desperate, there's the bee, uh, they agree to the plan, and so the bee is sent out to search for Telepanu. The bee, nearly exhausted, poor bee, uh, you know, wondering, you know, did discover him and did find him deep asleep. So to wake him, the bee stings both hands and feet and then smears wax on his eyes and feet, which was intended to purify him. The bee stings uh, Telpanu even more, and so he begins to be so angry that he wrecks destruction upon the world. Well, he's been stung by a bee. He's wrecking the rivers and shattering the houses, and, and it's mentioned specifically he's shattering their windows. We're back to windows again, right? Meanwhile, the bee returned to the gods and asked for an eagle to carry Telpanu back to the queen, Hanahana, uh, arranging for a magical remedy to calm Telpanu. Let's go to the next image. And who's going to calm him? Well, of course, um, uh, it, her name is Kamru Seppa. Kamru Seppa is the goddess of magic. So Kamru Seppa is going to be calming him uh, through her magical works because he's destroying everything. And so Kamru Seppa uh, puts together a spell to drive out the evil spirit that is believed to inhabit Telpanu. Uh, she, uh, how, I, how do I say, she, quote, smoothed Telepanu's mind with cream, sweetened his disposition with honey, cleansed his body with oil, and eased his soul with ointment. At first, he responded with lightning, but then finally, the magic uh, works and Telpanu uh, work on him, and um, Telpanu becomes calm again. So it's a good story. Uh, and so as a result, where is this anger given? Oh, well, the anger that Telpanu has is given to the doorkeeper of the underworld and stored there. That's kind of interesting. Given to the, the underworld? Yeah. Okay, so we uh, take the image down. This is great. Thank you. So when Telpanu returns home, he restores fertility and tends to the life and vitality of the royal family. People uh, cleaned their homes and prepared for the new year uh, during this particular celebration as they hung the fleece of a lamb on a pole in the court of the temple, symbolizing Telepanu's gift of fertility and prosperity. Uh, so you have this big uh, celebration. Now, there's more about Hanahana, uh, who is the queen of heaven, who is understood as the mother of all gods, as we learned uh, from the story of Telepanu, uh, after, you know, obviously that uh, she was connected with uh, dispatching that bee and, you know, and she actually re recommends to the storm gods uh, that he pay the sea god the bride price for the sea god's daughter on their wedding. But uh, apparently, uh, she gets angry. How? Another? Fit? Yeah. So, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, you know, like son, like mother. Uh, so what happens is that she gets upset. She has a fit of anger, and so she goes away. Guess what happens? I wonder, well, she's the mother goddess, so cattle and sheep are stifled, and mothers, both human and animal, take no account of their children. Uh, after her anger is banished again uh, to the threshold of the dark earth, is interesting. So uh, in, in the Hittite tradition, and of course, even in these stories, if you're really angry, you give that anger to the earth. You pour it into that place. And that's how it goes away. You bury it. And they would do rituals in connection to the burial of various of, of, your, of this wrath that you would have. Anyway, so uh, there you have that. So you have these, these kinds of stories, right? Um, so she, she banishes this anger and she returns rejoicing. Um, uh, there's, a, there's another little bit here. Uh, I'm reading, banishing her anger 
uh, through the burning of what's called brushwood and allowing the vapor to enter her body. So, so there is this kind of idea where as you're, as you're giving your anger over to the earth, you're burning brushwood. And then it's going uh, from there. And it's, you're supposed to fill yourself with this. And this cleanses you. And then this moves through you and into uh, the earth. Yes. <laughs> Let's go to the next image. Uh, the Hittites did worship. Arishigal, uh, the name, of course, uh, of meaning uh, the the son of the earth. So they they did uh, worship this particular uh, deity, uh, as as they did the Mesopotamian civilization. For the Hittites, Arishigal was the mother of Tishub, uh, the, the storm god. Uh, she plays a role in his return from the underworld by guess what, opening the gates of the dark earth, <laughs> as you would expect. Appeasement of Rishigal through sheep sacrifices help remove threats uh, for various evil omens. Uh, so there you have it. Okay, so uh, that's we'll, we'll take this image down, but that's good. Uh, Inara was another uh, holding a prominent position in the Ilyanka story, and she was the daughter of the storm god and god, and she was the goddess of the wilderness, as well as wild animals in some contexts, right? You also have uh, Kumbari. Kumbari was the underworld god. Much of the story is told in the song of Kumbari. And so I have it here. So let's take an image of the tablet here. So this is the story that I will be talking about. So the next image is of this. There it is, the next one. There it is. So this is part of the story. You see, it's not exactly in great uh, great condition. We're we're missing parts of it. So I'll go ahead and start out. The song describes how the Hurrian god, by the name of Alalu, was once in charge of all the heavens. Alalu doesn't that sound familiar? Alalu, it's a Semitic word. Alalu, mm, Alalu. And the Alu with L and Allah. And, oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, once the primordial God, uh, the God of the earth, but also many people will connect this primordial God uh, with the Greek Uranus. The story relates as follows, which you see at the top line there. Once in the olden days, Alalus was king in heaven. As long as Alalus was seated on the throne, the mighty Anu, first amongst the gods, was standing before him. He would sink at his feet and set the drinking cup in his hand. Nine in number were the years that Alalus was king of heaven. But then Anu rose up and overthrew Alalu, which, by the way, in much the same way that Cronus overthrew his father, Uranus. It goes as follows. In the ninth year, Anu gave battle to Alalus, and he vanquished Alalus. He fled before him and went down to the dark earth. Down he went to the dark earth, but Anu took a seat upon the throne. As long as Anu was seated upon the throne, the mighty Kumarbi would give him his food. He would sink at his feet and set the drinking cup in his hand. Nine in number were the years that Anu was king in heaven. But guess what happens? I got a surprise. Eventually, Kumbari, or Kambaru, right? These different ways of saying it, rises up and overthrows Anu, and again in a similar manner that Zeus overthrew Kronos. In the ninth year, Anu gave battle uh, to Kambaru, and like Alalus, Kambaru gave battle to Anu. You gotta love how these things are written, though. When he could no longer withstand uh, Kumaru's eyes, he, Anu, he struggled forth from the hands, and he fled. I like, like the reference to the eyes. He, I can no longer stand the eyes staring at me. <laughs> I'm going to flee. And he fled like a bird moving into the sky. But then, after him, rushed Kamaru seized Anu by his feet and dragged him down from the sky. Now, 
I find this and she grabbed his foot and brought him down to the sky. What I find so interesting uh, is that is that when we go to Hindu stories, you know, uh, you know, you have the 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 old god, the old ancient god, right? Um, uh, so and uh, that is the the father god, uh, and um, and what happens is that uh, uh, he's all, obviously he's related. Uh, his name is Deus, right? Deus. And he's related, of course, to Zeus. This is now in Hinduism. And what happens is that uh, Indra uh, overthrows uh, this god and his regime. And he also grabs him by the foot, exactly the same, and pulls him down to heaven. It's the exact same story told amongst the Hittites as told by those of ancient India. Is that fascinating? So there you have it. All right. When Anu tried to escape, Kamaru bit off his genitals and spat out three new gods. Uh, in the text, Anu tells his son that he is now pregnant with Teshub, Hagris, and Tamusu. Um, it says, in thine inside, I have planted a heavy burden. I would say so. Firstly, I have impregnated thee with the noble storm god. Secondly, I have impregnated thee with the with the river Tigris, not to be endured. Thoroughly, I have impregnated thee with the noble uh, Tarmisus. The three dreadful gods have I planted in thy belly as seed. Thou shalt go and end by striking the rocks of thine own mountain with thy head. <laughs> It says you go you know, crazy, and you're going to, you know, because you're, because first of all, you know, you're male, uh, and second of all, you, you got three uh, gods in your in your belly, and um, this is going to hurt a lot, and so <laughs> you get the point. So, are you guys enjoying these stories? These are a little different than you would expect, uh, right? So, upon hearing this, uh, Kamaru spit the semen upon the ground, and it became impregnated with two children. When Anu had finished speaking, he went up to heaven and hid himself. Out of his mouth spat Kumbaru, the wise king. Out of his mouth he spat, and it goes on. And so Kumbaru is cut open uh, to deliver Teshub. Together, Anu and Teshub dispose of Kumbaru, and it just gets worse from there. Uh, so these are, what do you think of these stories? So there you have it. Um, now there is a more story because, hey, you know, people are into this. This is what people want to hear. Uh, there's another story. We'll take this down. But, uh, this, you, you know, you can see why. And I'll tell you this. These are the stories that they discovered in all these tablets. These are the kinds of stories. Do you think they're going to go over very well uh, in the early 20th century? Are you seeing why, in many cases, Hittite mythology uh, goes untranslated? Right, not that it, there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying, you can see how these these stories could cause some problems. Like this other story, Kamaru decided to create a rival to the storm god from his own seed, and so came upon a great sentient rock. So this rock has like spirit in it. In fact, it is described as a female cliff. And Kamaru proceeded to copulate with this uh, giant female um, cliff. It says, in the great rock lies, her length is three double hours, her width is double hours and a half. His desire was aroused and he slept with the rock. His manhood flowed into her five times he took her, ten times he took her. It goes on and on. It's in fragments. This is a part of the tablet you see that's falling apart. The giant rock then became pregnant with Kambaru's seed and gives birth uh, to Uli Kumi. Uh, and so, so, yeah. In another version, as a great stone, do you mean there's another version of the story? Well, oh, yeah. People can't get enough of these stories. As a great stone gave birth to Kambaru's son. You mean it, the rock gave birth to the son? Yeah. The, uh, the good woman uh, and the mother goddess received him. Uh, 
I'll go ahead and, and read this, right? So how does this work? So the woman brought him into the world, the good woman and the mother goddesses lifted the child and placed him upon Kumbari's knee. Kumbari began to fondle his son and let him dance up and down. He proceeded to give the child a propitious name. Kumbara began to say to his soul, what name shall I give him, the child which the good woman and the mother goddess presented to me? And so, and shot forth from her body as a shaft, let him go. And so we'll name him Ulakumi. Let him ascend to heaven for kingship. Let him vanquish Kumaya, the beautiful city. Let him attack the storm god and tear him to pieces like a mortal. Let him tread him down on foot like an ant. Let him crush Thomasus like a reed in the in, uh, in the break. And so when Kambaru finished these words, um, what happened is, well, he says, to whom shall I give him the ch this child? Who shall take him upon himself and treat him as a gift? Uh, and when the uh, Ursara deities heard these words, they took the child, they lifted him to the place upon Eli's knees, and Lel began to speak. Uh, and all of a sudden, what happened is that this deity became a giant shaft. So Ubelis becomes a giant shaft, almost like carrying the whole world upon its soldier so, shoulders, much like Atlas. And this shaft extended way up into the sky. And this shaft also extended deep down into the earth. Wow. And so the whole world is, 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 whole, is being held up by this giant shaft. And the storm god saw this, sat on the ground with tears streaming from his eyes, various water courses, thinking, there's no way I can defeat this particular god. So after an indecisive battle against Uli Kumi, the storm god Tishub is defeated. He flees. Uh, I mean, hello. But then Ia, who sometimes is connected uh, uh, to um, El, who lives uh, in the Ap Apsu, which is underground source of the Earth's waters. What he does is obtain a tooth cutting tool with which heavens and Earth were cut apart shortly after creation. This two tool, he says, will disable uh, Uli Kumi. And so he is given this particular tool and this great shaft is cut. Now, what I think is fascinating here is this idea of this, this shaft that holds, goes all the way to the heavens and then, of course, to the earth and then under the earth, because this reminds me of the Shiva Linga in many ways, holding all these areas. And we have similar stories, again, in Hinduism, which I find is absolutely uh, fascinating. Yeah. So, so much uh, going here uh, with these stories. Okay, so uh, let's go to the... The next image here. Okay. Okay. So we go here and uh, we have various goddesses here. And so um, this one here, uh, right here, uh, is sometimes uh, this, this right here is, sorry, as um, uh, Liwani. Uh, this is the goddess who ruled over the subterranean land of the dead and is oftentimes viewed as the queen of the gods uh, as, as well as the underworld. So uh, at first, uh, Lilawani was viewed as a god with the substitute ritual for the recovery, uh, referring to Lilawani as my lord. In this ritual, a good-looking woman was dispatched to the deity with animal and food offerings to serve as a substitute uh, for a mortally ill person who is also designated here as a great daughter, a title which is still very controversial. The actual fate of the female substitute uh, is, is not completely known, uh, but I do find uh, that uh, pretty interesting. So that's, uh, that's each, okay, so that is Luluana, right? Uh, there's another, take this one down. There's another deity that I want to talk about briefly. 
Uh, and that one is, thank you very much, Margie. That's, her name is Ishara. And she was originally a goddess from northern Syria. And uh, her first name is Ebla. And she was soon incorporated into the Hurrian pantheon. At first, she appears as a goddess of love in old uh, Akkadian uh, incantations. And in fact, already by the old Babylonian period, uh, there is temples dedicated to her. At time, her main epithet uh, was Lady of Love, which was also applied to Ishtar. And she was called upon to bless various sexual uh, unions. By the time, uh, uh, eventually, uh, Ashara was adopted by the Hurrians. She became associated with the underworld and understood as the astrological embodiment of the constellation of Scorpio and the mother of the seven stars. And she also moved from blessing sexual unions to healing the sick. So that by the time the Hittites adopted her, she was goddess of medicine as well. And she was in turn the goddess of oaths too. So quite quite a variety. There is another deity I want to talk about. Uh, her name is uh, Sal Saka. Sal Saka was originally a Haran goddess, but was adopted by the Hittites and was love, pure love in a sexual sense. She is love. She is also connected to fertility and war and healing as well. Uh, she's connected to Inanna and Ishtar. She's known to have very distinctive wings, and so she flips about, enticing humanity to procreate. But often, she acted on the whim, inspiring many to uh, copulate without any purpose, just for pleasure. She even causes chaos, the Sausaka, you know, for her own entertainment. So in a sense, I find this fascinating because it's not just about procreation. It's about pleasure. It's about enjoyment. Oh, but there's more. Because of this fact, Sausaka was appealed to in order to keep relationships as harmonious as possible, but also as unpredictable, just like herself. Hmm. What is also curious about Sausaka is that she is often displayed as sharing attributes related to both women and men. In fact, at uh, Yazokaya, uh, she is depicted twice once standing with the line of female deities and once standing in the line with male deities. She is both male and female. She is both. Hittite texts uh, talk about uh, her uh, who is clothed, quote, like a man and like a woman. Uh, and she has male attributes such as the axe and weapons. Because of this fact, um, she's often understood as a bisexual, even androgynous character, uh, much like we find even within uh, Etruscan deities. So I, I do find this interesting. In fact, I'll go a little bit further because I think you're intrigued. One of the Amarna letters uh, from ancient Egypt uh, addressed to the Pharaoh, dated between 1350 to 1335, discusses the loaning of a statue from the land of the Hittites with a letter entitled, a goddess travels to Egypt. Isn't that a great title for a letter? A goddess travels to Egypt. The short letter from the Hittite king uh, to Shratta states, Now in the time, too, of my father, went to this country, and just as earlier she dwelt there, and they honored her. May my brother now honor her ten times more than before. May my brother honor her then at his pleasure. Let her go so that she may come back. May Sausaka, the mistress of heaven, protect us, my brother and me, 100,000 years. Wow, that's a lot of years, huh? And may our mistress grant both of us great joy. And let us act as friends. Is Sausaka for me alone, my goddess? 
or for my brother, not his God. <laughs> See the switching to the gender here. Is that great? So, so she is both. Is this is this fascinating, right? So there you have it. So let's let's go to the next image. It'll be a, a kind of a grand finale here. There we go. This is the sanctuary site of Yazukaya. That's spelled Y-A-Z-I-L-I-K-A-Y-A. This is one of the most important Hittite holy sites located outside the capital city of Hutusas, uh, near where a spring issued from the rocks and flowed through a small alcove. Shaded by trees and carpeted with grass and flowers, the power and beauty of this particular location must have inspired the Hittites and earlier peoples to worship here. Uh, around the, the 15th century BCE, uh, several temples were built in the area, although crumbling foundations are all that remains to be seen. The most interesting part, however, is not these fallen temples but the figures of deities that are carved on the rock walls of two natural chambers of this roofless sanctuary. Let's go to the next image. The figures in the larger chamber give the impression of two processions. One of the male deities and one of the female deities advancing on either side towards the rear wall, where the principal god and goddess emphasized uh, both by their positions and by their greater size, meet one another at the focal point of the chamber. Now, the west wall is adorned with release of the gods, as I said, while the east wall, they're devoted to goddesses. So you see they're both side by side across the way. The division into male and female deities is uh, not absolute. However, there's three goddesses maybe discerned amongst the gods, uh, on, you know, on one side, and one god seems to be hanging out with the females. <laughs> so you, you always have those who defect. The goddesses wear long, beautiful robes, have braided hair and jewelry, uh, and are shown in the side view. The gods, uh, as you can imagine, remember, kilts are in. Mostly wear short kilts, turned up boots, and pointed hats, and they are facing forward as opposed to the side. It is thought that the number of horns decorating their pointed hats indicate their ranks amongst the gods. Uh, let's go to the next image. The deities' names are often, that's wonderful, often inscribed over their heads. From the deciphered names, we find that these deities had Haran, not Hittite names, right? Amongst the finely carved, though much weathered, as you can see here, relief carvings, are found the moon god, uh, Kasu, uh, the weather and storm god, Tashub, the earth goddess, Hippat, uh, and Sharuma, the son of Tishab and Hippat. Versions of uh, Tashuba or Tashub. Uh, the weather god are found throughout the ancient Middle East, uh, and so, but uh, uh, it's very prominent here at this particular site. There are remnants of cremations in this area, and that may mean that this was also a burial place uh, for Hittite royalty. Let's go to the next image, right? There are also uh, basins and drains for libations carved into the rock. Uh, each chamber was used for different kinds of ceremonies. You can see all here, uh, these various chambers. This is a great place to visit. Now, E.C. Krupp has interpreted the carvings in two galleries as a cosmic narrative depicting the renewal of creation and the continuity of the Hittite royal line. In fact, uh, he states, uh, let's go to the next one. He states that um, that facing Teshub in the central relief in chamber A is Hippat, the Hurrian earth mother goddess. As Teshub's bride, 
she coupled with him to deliver the world's seasonal cycles of birth, death, and rebirth. In this depiction, she uh, and Teshu participate in the ceremony that is known as the sacred marriage. All the other gods shown on the chamber walls have convened to witness and ratify this ritual matrimonial bond between heaven, Teshub, and earth, Hippot. In this way, the Hittites assembled the legion of gods into a huge family headed by the cosmic couple who joined the fertility of the sky with the fecundity of the earth to perpetuate the world. Yazukaya then was a fertile center of ritual renewal, a mini mountain love nest where divine nuptials were performed above the Hittite capital. The ceremonies, a time with the new year and the vernal equinox represented the beginning of time through, well, how do we say this? Godly pillow talk. <laughs> but Yezekiah is more than just a fertility shrine. The gods portrayed there and the ceremonies performed there long ago were not intended just to coax a little fecundity uh, back into the world. Rather, uh, the rock reliefs are the epitome of Hittite ideological art. Uh, among the gods, the sacred marriage culminates in a conjugal union that defines a hierarchy of cosmic power through divine lineage. When the king and queen ceremonial coupled, they renewed far more than the fruit of fields. Uh, their copulation was political. Impersonating the gods, the king and his paramour renewed their sovereignty through sacramental sex. In heaven and earth, bedroom politics promoted celestial sovereignty, and the Hittite royalty identified itself with the highest of gods. Wow, quite a bit going on here. Thank you. You can take down that image. That's great. So, so a few closing remarks. The Hittites did, unlike many civilizations, actually did have a concept of, of sin, which is interesting. Uh, so, so when Hittites sinned, they could expect physical punishments, uh, typically illness. If they persuaded the gods um, you know, that they had reformed, their illnesses would be relieved. So illness was a way to show whether they sinned or not. One example of a perceived sin leading to punishment is found in the words of the 14th century BCE, uh, a prince by the name of Katuzeli. Yet, unfortunately, he did not know what sin he did. <laughs> I must have committed some kind of sin. I just don't know what I did. Uh, he's hoping some way he can remedy it. So he says as follows. He says, my God. Ever since my mother gave to birth to me, my God, you have raised me. And the more I grew up, the more I had tested my God's mercy and wisdom and everything. Never did I swear by my God, and never did I break the oak. Now, may my God open up his innermost soul to me with all his heart, and may he tell me my sins? so I may acknowledge them? What have I, Akutazeli, ever done to my God? And in what way have I sinned against my God? You made me, you created me, but now what have I, Kutazeli, done to you? Uh, he does not want, right? So, you know, he does not want his reputation to be denigrated, he says, in the presence of other humans. Uh, so he's telling me what it is, right? What it is. Uh, hopefully he got his answer, right? Now, um, also, um, it's interesting when it comes to their magic. Most of the magical rituals were per performed by both male and female practitioners. Uh, and many of these were, were practitioners uh, from the Luvian lands. Uh, and the origins are often said at the beginning of these magical texts. 
Um, so uh, there is, uh, however, uh, what is designated as the Lord of the Ritual. And on these tablets, that is the person who commissioned it. Uh, and it is believed that this person who is this Lord of the Ritual or 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 uh, Maiden of the Ritual played a passive role that is generally considered secondary. Yet there are rituals that can be performed uh, also directly by the practitioner uh, where they could not only say the formula, but perform the magical ritual itself, receiving assistance only during the slaughtering of the animals and the cooking of the meat. So, so you could either do it in a ceremonial sense and have it done for you and you play a passive role and just watch it all happen and pay the pit <laughs> you gotta pay for all the supplies you know or uh you could go ahead and uh do it yourself right uh so there's a few of these rituals here and i i may want to kind of tempted to read just a few of them so you kind of understand so let's go let's go read one of them so here we go okay um one of these is titled if the moon gives an omen, and if the enemy defeats the army. The first part of the text itself reads, If against a man his companion lifts his tongue, or he invokes the gods against him, this is the ritual suitable for him. Okay, you got it? So so, it, so basically, if a man... Uh, you know, you know, if his companion says something that is not very nice and even invokes the gods against them, <laughs> this is what you're supposed to do. Here's the ritual. They bring out to the grassland a loaf of bread and a jug of wine. So you grab a loaf of bread and jug of wine. He breaks the loaf on the left and puts it on the ground. Then he offers the wine, guess where? On the left as well, and speaks the following way. Whatever person has lifted his tongue before the gods, whoever invoked the gods against me, as this grass is dry, let him and his house go dry in the same way too. Let the gods and the lords Look at him with evil eyes. <laughs> we're back to the back to eyes again. Again, we're back to windows and eyes, right? Um, let him begat neither son nor a daughter. Ooh. Uh, let his grain not grow. Okay, so you say that. Then he puts the loaf on its place and shatters the jug. He washes his hand and goes away. Then he puts a small table before the sun got. He puts bread on it. He puts three loaves of bread upon it. He sacrifices a ram to the sun god and then slaughters it. He offers beer or wine. That's called kas yistin and speaks the following way. Oh, sun god, you are constantly looking into man's heart but nobody's able to look into your heart. Who made a bad action? You were above him. I was going through a good way. Whoever hurts me, you, sun god, look at him. Again, we're back to the looking game. Watch out. You guys want to hear another one? <laughs> Are you guys taking notes? I'm kind of worried. <laughs> All right, let's, let's do another one. I, I know, these are interesting. Another ritual that is contained in the same text as the last mentioned, runs as follows. Let myself and my house grow. Let people of my house, cattle and sheep, beget a proper way and let my grain grow. They slaughter the sheep and they put the meat, the entrails, the chest, its head and feet before the table. They cook the entrails and break the loaves. He outs one broken loaf of bread on the ground and recites lots. You guys know lots of bread going on there too, right? You, which by the way, you is the table. <laughs> you who stands in front of the sun god. I never thought of calling 
you know, an object you, but stand before the sun, God. Keep speaking favorably about me across to the sun, God. So the idea is that this table that's holding the bread is speaking, communicating uh, to the sun, God. Got it? He breaks uh, the loaves of bread and puts them on the table again. And he puts the entrails in front of them. So now he's adding a little extra. He offers wine and they cook the fat meat and eat it. So now you're participating. You're, you're connecting. You're participating of this offering. They drink three times, pick up the table, and go away. <laughs> if someone sacrifices for the storm god and addition, other gods, this is one possible ritual and these are the words. So, yeah. So this is another ritual, right? So this is a, this is a prosperity one to help you out. And again, you have the symbol of of the bread and upon the table. And this bread and the table mediates between you and that and and the God. And there's a communion between you and the God through this. And the blessings then come upon you uh, through this ritual action. A third spell for the same collection goes if anyone buys a field and violates the boundary he takes a thick loaf and breaks it to the sun god and says you fixed my scale into the ground and he speaks sun god sun god no quarrel was meant uh so in other words if somebody messes up when it comes to figuring out the property line the sun god's going to take care of this you just do this ritual and everything will be okay i didn't mean any harm sun god's with me one ritual against pestilence provides a means to appease gods uh, that have been offended by sin. Go back to the sin idea. It goes as follows. If people are dying in the country and some enemy god has done that, I act as follows. They drive up one lamb, sorry, one ram. They drive up one ram. They twin together blue wool, red wool, yellow wool, black wool and white wool make it into a crown and crown the ram with it did you guys get this okay if people are dying in the country and some enemy god has done that so there's pestilence in the land uh you see so you drive up one ram uh and then you have this, this multi-colored wool that you weave together and you put this on uh, you crown the ram with it, you know. Now you drive the ram onto the road leading to the enemy, and while doing so, speak as follows. So now this, 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 this so now this, 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 this ram, you know, that's crowned with this multi-colored uh, wool, is is walking towards uh, the enemy. That being the enemy god who has caused this pestilence. And and as well, it says, whatever God of the enemy land has caused the plague, see, you say, we have driven up this crown ram to pacify thee, O God, just as the herd is strong, but keeps peace with the ram. Do thou, the God who has caused this plague, keep peace with the Hathi land. This is interesting, right? You want, you want another one? I know you guys want magic. Okay, all right. So the Hasawa is a concept that is really difficult to describe. Um, but um, basically it is a, uh, a, a prominent amongst the experts in ritual procedure, which included many males, um, but also a group of female practitioners and one that's referring to as the old woman. Uh, which, of course, the Hittite term, uh, again, is the Husawa, uh, perhaps originally used for midwives, since it literally means not old woman, but rather she of birth. At all events, the women so designated were multi-skilled professionals who may often have collaborated with doctors, augurs, incantation priests, and other practitioners in the art of ritual performance, uh, divination, healing as was the case with scribes many have been uh continuing various family traditions inheriting this occupation 
Uh, so the names of 14 of these women have survived as authors of rituals that they practiced. The women were certainly literate involved. Uh, many were bilingual uh, to a greater or lesser degree. And so, uh, so there you have it. And so they were also uh, involved. In, now, the, the, now, of course, the rituals had to be performed exactly in the correct way. It included, of course, foodstuffs and other consumables, and as well as play and wax and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so there you have it. So you have female uh, magic quite a bit. Uh, for the Hittites, the gods had to be pre present, sorry, present uh, in their world. Uh, for prosperity and well-being to flourish. So this idea that uh, the gods have to be there. And so this Husawa ritual is that which brings these deities right there. In fact, um, uh, so it became the job of the Husawa to release nature from uh, stifling and starvation. The Husawa attempted to bring the gods back through attraction. So how do you attract the gods? Well. A good food and drink is one way to attract the gods. Uh, sweet honey is another way. Uh, sometimes she marked a path that says back home by laying out branches and textiles stretching in all directions. She performed a variety of elaborate procedures such as sacrifices. But more important than these actions, she accompanied her goals primarily through her words. There was a Hittite proverb that the tongue is a bridge. I love this saying, the tongue is a bridge. That is the bridge between God and humanity. She told the story of finding the missing God, appeasing him and releasing his anger. Indeed, we have these myths preserved because they were included in the directions for her rights. And so this is the idea of appeasement of the various gods. So, um, and of course, we also have rituals that connect to the Luvians, but that's another talk. So you have a taste of, of Hittite magic. You have uh, an understanding of the Hittite gods and goddesses. You have an idea of how rituals were performed and how they viewed their deities. You have a, a summation in general of the history of the Hittites and what they ate uh, and uh, how they practiced their laws. It is a very different culture than from the Egyptians or from the Mesopotamian civilization. Uh, and in many ways, it's because it is uh, a, a three-layer cake. Uh, you have the earlier indigenous Anatolian mother goddess belief system. And on top of that, uh, you have the Hattians and the Harans who are related to that those earlier Anatolian civilizations. And so this is very much a either egalitarian or matriarchal society. And then suddenly you got these, uh, these the Indo-Europeans arriving from the north. Uh, these are the Hittites and the Luvians, and they're patriarchal. But what happens is the area itself has a context that envelops their beliefs and changes it and modifies it so that it is very different from other Indo-European uh, perspectives. Uh, one thing, I could sum this up in just a little bit, and that is to say that it is very extremely sensual. It is absolutely focused uh, not only on agricultural fertility, but also human fertility, but also the enjoyment of that process. And so a lot of these gods are connected to love and pleasure and enjoyment. Uh, and so for them, the interrelation in this way of, of, of intercourse is something that connects with how the world is created, how it connects has above, so below. You have the sky, which is male. You have the earth, which is female, and it's coming forth together. It is a marriage of both together and so all of nature is harmonized in this way through oftentimes ritual practice, whether with between the king and the queen uh, at the great sacred site or between individuals. 
This is all important. I think that uh, is a major takeaway when it comes to Hittite beliefs. So there we go. So we have explored uh, another civilization, and I think I'm going to close up right now. So thank you so much for coming. And there, I'm going to have some water. Ah. Uh.